Right. Well, I think the waiting room is mostly cleared. So welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Wynn Chesson. I am from the Stanford Business School class of 2017. And I would not be here without the class of 1980 and the incredible nonprofit that they have built together and welcomed the rest of the GSV community into Project Redwood. Tonight's event is brought to you by the Stanford Alumni Chapter of New York City and also Project Redwood. For people that are new to Project Redwood, it is a um, nonprofit partnership of alumni from all classes, but that started at the um, 25th reunion of the class of 1980. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that. But before we dive into anything, I just wanna do a couple of housekeeping items as people join. Um, first, uh, we have this because we want it to be a dialogue. So you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself, which is a little bit dangerous sometimes, but we are trusting you to manage your mute function. Um, but we're doing that because we hope that throughout the conversation that you will ask questions, that, will, that you will unmute yourself to ask the questions. And if you're not comfortable doing that, feel free to use the chat box. We'll be monitoring that, but we really do encourage you to bring your voice into the conversation. So be mindful of mute is uh, request number one. Also, we would love to see your beautiful faces. So if you're comfortable, please put on your video. We understand you might be eating. That's totally fine. It's dinner time for most of us right now, but we would love to see you if you're, um, if you're able to, to turn on your video. And with that, um, I will just tell you a little bit about tonight. We've organized it in two big parts. This is the first part over Zoom. And then around 8.15, we're gonna actually switch platforms so that we can have uh, a more interactive opportunity to continue the conversation, to pick up on some of the themes that are gonna come up tonight and to take them even deeper. So we're gonna use Remo, which is a platform. We'll put it in the chat. If you're not new to it, it's pretty intuitive. It's very similar to Zoom, except for there's tables set up where you can move your avatar, like your little face picture around and join tables of up to six people to have a more intimate dialogue with the people that you see here on the screen. So we hope that you'll join us for part two, but I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Part one is gonna be incredible. So we've divided it up. Tonight we are gonna have an incredible dialogue facilitated by Hal Logan. Hal Logan, is a member familiar to members of the class of 80 because he's in your class. He um, has had an incredibly distingu distinguished career starting with the Washington Post where he still posts op-eds. His most recent op-ed was actually on the, one of the topics that we're gonna be addressing tonight under the headline, Black Americans can get ahead by enlisting the support of American capitalists. So you can Google that and find Hal online. Um, in his professional life, Hal is also a business innovator. He's created groundbreaking, profitable new businesses in widely divergent environments, including Fortune 1000 companies and pure startups. In his most recent role, Hal served as chief executive officer of Buybook Technologies, and that was his third role as a CEO. Um, and finally, most relevant for tonight, Hal was a member of the class of 1980 and is a co-chair of the Project Redwood Racial Equity Task Force, which has helped put tonight's event together and help us figure out two of the grantees that we wanted to spotlight um, this evening. So how we'll introduce our grantees and um, I'm gonna turn it over to him, but thank you so much for joining. Uh, we hope that you will stay involved and get more involved with Project Redwood if it's new to you. Um, over, I joined recently after graduating at a time when Project Redwood was granting out about $200,000 a year to usually around eight grantees. Over the last year during COVID, um, Project Redwood has dramatically increased its giving really in um, you know, rising to the times. And over the past year has awarded over half a million dollars in grants to um, 16 grantees, including 17 um, COVID response grants. So it's really a wonderful organization um, and not only are they devoted to their mission of alleviating global, global poverty, but they um, have also set the goal of increasing the number of participants that are from outside the year of 1980. That's how I got involved. Right now it's about a third of the membership. And over this year, we're hoping that it will become over half. 
So hopefully if that's you, if this is something that is interesting, it's a really meaningful way to connect with other Stanford GSB alums and to do something that um, is really relevant. So without further ado, I will give it to Hal to introduce our grantees and to lead us through tonight's conversation. Thank you again for joining and over to you, Hal. Thank you, Wynn. And uh, once again, welcome to everybody who uh, has chosen to join us this evening. Um, I am looking forward to a uh, lively and informative discussion with two of the really marquee grantees that Project Redwood has been involved with here in the United States. Um, so um, we're gonna hear from uh, one uh, grantee that's doing some really phenomenal work in the area of education. Uh, the Cristo Ray School Network, you, know, you will hear about from people who can talk about it much more authoritatively than I can, but it's a network of 37 high schools uh, and cities around the United States that are taking young people from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds, most of them black and brown students, and producing outstanding academic results, uh, very, very high rates of admission to, uh, to college uh, with a really innovative approach to learning that uh, the folks from Crystal Ray will talk about a bit this evening. Uh, and then uh, we will also hear from a project called Mortar, uh, which is a, an entrepreneurship training project uh, operating in Cincinnati and several other cities in the Midwest. Again, doing just a phenomenal job of preparing um, uh, entrepreneurs of color to be successful in starting and, uh, and running small businesses. So uh, I, I think you will hear from people that are doing really groundbreaking, really successful work in some of the most challenging areas that our society offers. So, um, uh, you know, as Wen said, um, we're gonna, we're gonna spend about 15 minutes with each, with each of them. We really do want to hear from you with any questions or thoughts that you may have. So please feel free to jump in. Um, and uh, I think we're gonna start with a video presentation. Uh, and, um, we, are, are we starting with uh, with Mortar or with Crystal Ray? Uh, when, which, which are we going with first? We're starting with Mortar and Alan Wood. So I guess we can queue up that video, please. Fantastic. When you remove people, you remove stories. And you remove the soul of a neighborhood. You end up with a blank canvas where there was actually a masterpiece that was once painted underneath. The story of Over the Rhine is not unlike a lot of other American cities. About 15 years ago, developers started to look at it as a potential opportunity for the future. The neighborhood has shifted tremendously, but we're not seeing the same growth in business ownership for people of color. We just want to make sure that the entrepreneurs who live in the neighborhood are the ones who get the first crack at being able to start their entrepreneurial enterprises right in that space. And that's how Mortar was born. <laughs> Mortar's mission is to empower people who've been systemically oppressed, held back, and not allowed to progress in the world of entrepreneurship. We do that through offering a 15-week course we offer pop-up shop spaces, and we also have a loan fund that helps to capitalize these businesses. This is our fifth year. We get a wide array of different types of businesses, food, fashion, just creatives in general. We get to kind of incubate these ideas and get them to the point where they're ready to step out. The staff at Mortar showed me that I have a gift, I can make this business happen, and I can be an entrepreneur. And since being a part of it, my dreams are coming true. Awesome. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. You're Thank killing you. It, Thank you so All much. Right. The goal at Pitch Night is for our graduates to really just celebrate the fact that they've accomplished this. How are we doing? I see y'all. US Bank has been an amazing partner from the beginning. They are one of our funders for the prize money that we give away to entrepreneurs, making sure they're able to have the capital they need to get started or to grow. It gives a certain legitimacy to the work that we're doing. 
This is the moment when they kind of show everybody who they've become and who they want to ultimately be. Time to award some prizes. Alicia Stevenson. Not only Cincinnati, but we're going to change America. So I'm hoping America's ready. When you remove. So um, uh, I, it, it's hard not to be moved by by that presentation of what Mortar's doing. So um, I'd like to welcome Alan Woods, who is the uh, founder and, and head of Mortar. Um, Alan, uh, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you came up with the uh, with the idea of, of building a, a, an incubator? Absolutely. Uh, first off, thank you for having me here. Um, short version of my story is that I started as an entrepreneur at 12. I was a kid with a camera and uh, a passion for photography and uh, had parents that were very supportive of that dream of being a photographer and were able to take me and, uh, you know, nurture that gift and that talent. And they took me to an art, art exhibit uh, where I actually met Gordon Parks, um, and uh, it, it changed my life. You know, so having that conversation with him, being able to see his work and how it impacted me and others, uh, really made me want to pursue the the work that I do with photography. Uh, and so when I became an adult and really started to think back to my journey as an entrepreneur and how I went from being a photographer to uh, getting my graphic design degree and kind of just creating this business that was uh, a creative driven business. Uh, when it came time to really start thinking about how to assist other people, it was mostly through graphic design and brand strategy. And so when uh, my two other co-founders and I kind of collaborated to create Mortar, for me, it was literally like building my dream job. It gave me an opportunity to take all of the things that I had ever learned um, from making tons of mistakes all by myself with no mentors and no real guidance um, and really just using those things to help other people in that process. So um, ultimately, we built a replication of the process of support that I had from my parents um, because I didn't realize at that time, you know, what it looked like to not have that support. And that, you know, when we started building Mortar, trying to make sure that, you know, people had access to a network and people had access to the connections and people had access to the places and the resources and, you know, the support and guidance that they needed to get started. Uh, ultimately, it was at that time that I realized how good I had it as a kid. I don't, I don't think I realized it at the time, you know, I was uh, a kid that took everything for granted, you know, because I didn't know anything different. And so ultimately, when we built Mortar, we said that we wanted to create a platform that would help people who had the gifts, talents, and abilities, and maybe were missing some of the other things that have helped other entrepreneurs become successful. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were creating that entity for other people who lived in these neighborhoods, like over the Rhine, as I mentioned in the video, who are just as talented and just as uh, you, some of them are out cooking every restaurant in the neighborhood, you know, but what's the difference between the grandmother who sells plates after church on Sundays or does the bake sale and the new restaurateur who opens up a brand new restaurant in the neighborhood, um, you know, and, and typically it's because they have had a couple additional things uh, that happen along their journey. And so we want to make sure that we're kind of trying to even the playing field for those entrepreneurs who maybe don't typically get the opportunity. That's great. Thank you very much. So, so what is the mortar program? I mean, if, if uh, it, when, when you, when an entrepreneur comes to you, um, yeah. what, what is the program that you put them through? Yeah, so uh, the short version is that we have five different pillars uh, that we work with um, that kind of helps move people through the system of uh, coming in after they, you know, sign up and do their application through completion of our full programming. Um, and that first pillar is the academy. 
Um, and what that is, is 15 weeks of going through entrepreneurship training. Uh, it's a culturally competent training that we have actually created. Uh, when we first started almost seven years ago, we were utilizing another curriculum that we found um, and it just didn't speak the narrative that we were looking for. You know, it didn't speak to uh, people of color uh, because it was written by white men, you know, so the, the stories and the experiences that they had gone through didn't necessarily mirror some of the challenges that were additional challenges that our participants were having. The majority of our participants are black women. So um, there was definitely a disconnect there. So we wrote our own curriculum to really meet our participants where they were. So in that academy, they go through our 15 week accelerator using that curriculum to help to get them started or scale you know, in that process. The second pillar is our alumni program which is 18 months of ongoing mentorship, guidance, guardrails, uh, and sometimes lots of tears and laughter. Um, in, in that process, we just wanna make sure that they have the support system that they need um, and that they realize that they are not alone during this process. The uh, third pillar is space. So uh, for a lot of our entrepreneurs who are trying to do a brick and mortar location or restaurant or boutique, uh, they haven't been in business long enough for them to go and sign a, uh, a lease with the landlord. So what we've done is we've actually created a system where we will go and we will sign the lease on our behalf and then we license it to them. Um, and because we built those relationships in the community, you know, we're, we're essentially creating an atmosphere where they can go in and test out their ideas in real time with real money um and with real customers and they can get the feedback that they need to learn what they need to improve or uh, learn what's working well the next one is our access to capital um so we have created a program called the iron chest um which has delivered two hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars directly into the hands of entrepreneurs in cincinnati uh, and that's through loans grants and equity investments um, and so it gives us the ability to really make sure that these businesses have the foundation that they need. So after they've learned how to start the business and they have the mentorship and guidance and they have the place, we are now making sure that they have the capital to get started so that they can sustain the business. And then the last uh, pillar of our work is advocacy. Um, you could say that it lives through all of those different uh, pillars that I described already, but the advocacy piece, a lot of times it can be in having conversations with local government, it can be um, having those conversations with developers and explaining to them why it's important and how it benefits them to make sure that they are uh, having some, some lens of inclusion in the, the development that they are creating so that it does not mirror gentrification. Um, and so we're making sure that we're having those conversations that are often difficult conversations to have, um, but we're in the room. So we're, we're going to advocate for our participants and have some of those harder conversations that they might not um, typically be in a room to have. Great, so you started in a particular neighborhood in Cincinnati. Correct. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, I love the sound of what you're doing, and it really sounds like you're making a difference in people's lives. But scale is always an issue, right? I mean, yeah. um, it, it's, it's um, the, the problems that we're looking at in terms of racial equity are so big and so pervasive that, uh, you know, you just wonder when you get um, these little nuggets, these really wonderful um, initiatives like the one that you have, how scalable are you? How 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 big can mortar grow, and how big yeah. of impact do you think you can have beyond the place where you start? Yeah, I think that mortar will only have the capability to go to any city that's been affected by uh, racism in America. So, I mean, I guess that means that it's unlimited. I don't, I don't know. I mean, like there, there have been systems in place um, that have been put in place by banks, by government, by systems in general that have created this, this gap for black and brown entrepreneurs and women. So as long as the city has experienced that in some regard, they are probably experiencing the same exact things or the uh, remnants of those systems today. 
Um, and so that's what makes this program so replicable in other cities around the nation is because the the systems were replicable. You know, so when when banks and institutions design, design redlining, it was replicable. It was something that could be done in multiple communities around the United States. Um, and when they ran highways through black neighborhoods, that was replicable. It was something that was able to deteriorate neighborhoods. Um, and so what we're building is kind of the, the reverse engineering of those systems. And so we're creating kind of the solution to, to some of the systemic challenges that those things and other uh, items that have taken place historically in America have created. And we're kind of creating some of the solutions to that. So it's only scalable to the point of uh, places that have been affected by racism, uh, who have been affected by systems that have oppressed women. Um, you know, I was talking to one of my mentors who mentioned recently that, you know, when she was a young woman, she could not get a credit card unless she had a man who could co-sign for her. Um, and it was just like, I was blown away by that. I, I mean, I don't know why I was surprised by it, but it's just like, we're just in such a different time now that that is not a thing that, you know, my daughters will have to worry about. Um, but then knowing that it wasn't that long ago that a, a woman had to do that, or that long ago that somebody who looked like me or, or you, how or was, was legally not allowed to purchase a home because we couldn't get the mortgage. And when you can't get a mortgage, it makes it really difficult to get a second mortgage so you can pull equity out of your home to start a business. Um, and those are some of the things that we are not having conversations about uh, when we tell people to, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. We're so far behind because of the systems that we have to um, kind of you know, put this into warp speed to make sure that we're creating the platform that, that people can actually benefit from so that they can get started. So, um, you know, I think those of us who have been around Project Redwood have heard quite a lot about the successes that you guys have had with entrepreneurs in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, I think though, sometimes we learn as much or maybe even more from our failures as yeah. we learn from our successes. So I wonder, if you could share with the folks on this call this afternoon, you know, what, what's happened when you're, you've had people in the program and it hasn't worked? What's that yeah. taught you about, the, you know, either the right kinds of uh, entrepreneurs or the right kinds of businesses, or maybe even about your own curriculum that, that, that helps you grow and improve as time goes on? Yeah, the first thing that we learned early on is that, um, no matter how much you want to help people, you can only do so much. They have to uh, meet you somewhere. Uh, when we first started, we offered several of our participants full scholarships. And literally every single person who got a full scholarship to our program dropped out. And we were like, what is happening? Like, why, why are they not seeing the value? But ultimately, when it came down to time for them to make a decision, they realized, well, I didn't pay anything for this, you know? So, you know, that was one of the things that we learned early on. So we do charge for our program so that our participants have skin in the game, but we don't make anything from the money that they, they provide for us. I mean, we're losing money through, you know, paying our facilitators. So our, through our grants and things like that, we actually are subsidizing all of the costs for their tuition, but we do require them to make a payment that builds out into covering the cost of their 15 weeks and their 18 months of alumni uh, experience. But we're, we're charging $295 for essentially two years of services. Um, so it's definitely something where people are, you know, recognizing, oh, I have skin in the game and I really want to see this thing through. Um, so that was one of the major things that we learned early on. The other thing was that you know, having that variety of businesses, everybody wants to go the easy route or the thing that they, they feel is going to be easiest, you know? So if I have another person apply with a cupcake business, I don't, I don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. Like, it's just like, how many cupcakes do you people think we can eat here? You know, like, it's, it's, and so we have started to change the way 
that we accept participants into the program. So yes, we want to help people, but then we've also started to uh, look at it as an approach of building a portfolio. So in the same way that if you were doing investments and you're looking to diversify your portfolio, you are starting to look at, at how we're selecting our businesses as, you know, we become oftentimes a, a bridge to other clients. So people will call us and say, hey, we're looking for someone to do blank. And it's a lot easier to recommend four different people who offer this type of thing and then they can have those conversations and select. But if you have 40 different people who are doing the same type of business, it makes it really difficult to refer one or two because then the other 38 are like, well, why didn't you refer me? So we are being very selective and kind of creating a portfolio of different entrepreneurs. And we've had 300 graduates in Cincinnati alone um, and you mentioned scale, like we are currently operating in Kansas City, Missouri. We're in Covington, Kentucky, Akron, Ohio, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we just recently signed, uh, and by just recently, I mean within the last two weeks, we're going to be going to Indianapolis, Indiana, and also to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, so we, this is something that is scalable. It is something that we're learning from in this process, and as we scale, we are asking questions to get a better understanding of the landscape of the communities that we're operating in because we think that it's really valuable to learn what we can from people who are doing the work on the ground. Uh, and for this year, specifically in Tulsa, it's a, a really um, important year uh, because this is the 100 year commemoration of the Black Wall Street massacre. Um, so that took place uh, on May 31st and June 1st of 1921. Um, so for any of you who are not familiar with that, please uh, do some research on uh, Black Wall Street Tulsa and, and see what it looks like to have uh, thriving economies that are destroyed by domestic terrorists um, and what that looks like and how we are trying to recreate um, those systems of economic self-sufficiency, um, you know, similar to what was taking place in Black Wall Street. Well, man, I, uh, you, you, have, uh, you have teed up some really, really interesting thoughts here. Uh, I thank you very much. Let me just ask you one last question. Um, you know, you, have, you got a, a grant from Project Redwood um, last year. Um, can you just give us a sense of how you used uh, not only the grant, but the, uh, the other resources that Redwood makes available to its grantee? Absolutely. Um, for us, uh, 2020 was actually not the bad year that most people had. Um, it was actually one of our best years. It gave us an opportunity to refocus, to redirect, and to think about you know, prioritizing the things that are going to be the best for our participants. Um, I'm also happy to uh, acknowledge that though there were a lot of businesses that had challenges and were uh, forced to close last year, that is not the story of any of Mortar's graduates in Cincinnati. Um, so we're really thankful for being in that position. The grant gave us an opportunity to really start to think about what would happen if we were hypothetically not able to meet in the same room to do our cohort, you know, which is typically how we engage. Um, so we really started to think about developing a digital platform that would allow us to create kind of the self-guided version of our curriculum, which will enable people to download an app and um, there's different tiers of it. So we'll have like a freemium version of the curriculum where you can go through several modules that kind of help you start thinking about your business differently. And then if you enjoy that, then you have the option of paying for the paid version. Um, so the, the grant from Project Redwood was designed around um, building out a digital platform and doing kind of that, that research and development of really getting a better understanding of what it will take for us to create something like that, that we can roll out nationally, um, where anybody with a smartphone or anybody with a laptop and Wi-Fi will be able to uh, start to pursue their passions, no matter uh, what their socioeconomic status or their background. We just want to create something that is truly creating an equitable entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, we want to start by doing that online. Thank you, Alan. Um, Thank, you. Thank you very much. So, you know, when, when people talk about the racial equity agenda in this country, there are certain subjects that come up over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wealth gap. 
you know, the average black family in this country has uh, somewhere between one eighth and one tenth the net worth of the average white family. There's a there's a big income gap. Um, I think black families on average make about 61 cents to the dollar that white families make. And I think the work that you are doing is directed at both of those really, really critical components of the racial equity agenda. So I thank you for your work and look forward to talking with you more as we get into the Remo part of this of this afternoon's session. Absolutely. Thank One you. of the other really big issues, uh, and perhaps maybe the, uh, the, the, the fundamental issue uh, around racial equity is education. Um, uh, you know, I think we all know that uh, a good education prepares people for a successful life and the absence of a good education really dooms people to a very, very difficult life in almost every case. And getting good academic outcomes for low income children of color is one of the most challenging things uh, that, that, that exists in this country. It, it's, it's a place where uh, our systems are failing and they've been failing for 50 years. And there are very, very few really bright spots in that landscape. Thankfully, we have one of those bright spots with us here this afternoon. The Crystal Ray Network, as I alluded to a bit earlier, um, is really producing outstanding results. And I, I think we've got a video that will give you a bit of flavor for uh, some of the people who are benefiting from what Crystal Ray does. I'm Emily Mojica, obviously. Um, I'm 20 years old. I graduated Crystal Ray in 2018. I now go to Fordham University. My name is Eliana Mojica. I'm 16 years old. I'm a junior here at Crystal Ray. I'm Esther Mojica. I am a senior here at Crystal Ray and I am part of the class of 2021. We come from the Dominican Republic where we are an immigrant family. We're a family of seven. There's five kids. We're mainly girls. We have one baby brother. Poor kid. <laughs> and so my parents like really just instilled that what does Bobby always say? To never grow complacent. Yeah. Yeah. To never grow to never grow complacent. To always have like this hunger. And because of that, we're very ambitious. Once we got to Crystal mm -hmm. Ray, it became like a weekly thing <laughs> because we would be overwhelmed with like stress and things, and he would say, No, we have to keep going. Like, you can't grow complacent. There's so much more that we have to achieve, and Crystal Ray does that for us. The attention given to every single student here, it's irreplaceable. You don't find that in a lot of schools. Christy Ray puts a lot of emphasis on their main principle of cura personalis, caring for the whole person. And I think that's what really brought me to Christy Ray and made me feel welcomed and accepted because they cared for me outside of the academics. They put you first. Yeah, they put me first. You go through challenges as a Christy Ray student going to school four days a week and then having to go into the corporate setting one day a week, that's challenging in itself, having to pretend to be an adult when you're 14. You lose confidence sometimes and these people have faith in you and they become a family. This is what a heart attack feels like. I got into Barnard College. My sister's going to Barnard mm -hmm. College, Columbia University. Yes. yes. We are so <laughs> proud of Esther. We are her number one supporter. I think we cried more than her when the thing. No, that's not true. I cried a lot. Wow. <laughs> Girl, you no, cried I was more too, than her. I was too happy to cry. And we screamed more than her. Well, we believe in her. I believe in her. We knew it was gonna happen. Esther wants to succeed, but she cares that everybody else succeeds in the room. She's kind. <laughs> she, you are. Um, Don't cry. You are. <laughs> I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> Eliana is bright. She is the light of our family. We are all very serious people, <laughs> and she makes us all light enough She's the most balanced. If I were to describe Emily, it would probably be that she's a role model 
because that she went to Costa Rica and we saw its effects on her, we, we follow after her. She's our leader. I knew that whatever school I decided to go to, they didn't really have a choice after that because <laughs> I, was setting, I was setting the standard, I was setting the stage. My biggest takeaway from Costa Rica has definitely been my job. The relationships and networking that I've done there, it, it has me set for life, to be honest. I don't think I would fit in anywhere else except for Costa Rica. It's a whole community that's so accepting. It just makes you realize that this is the place where you belong. What sets Chris Array students apart from everybody else is like we all have this common attribute and you see it. Like we have this hunger and this motivation. We're driven. And, yeah, we're very driven. Like once we we come into Chris Array, it's all it's time to work. It's time to work. What sets us apart is that we come out college ready. Emily has told us all the time <laughs> that if we can do Chris Array, we can do college. And you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Chris Array students, they know the adversities that they're facing. That's their fuel, and that's why Crystal Ray works. Because we have adversities, that's why we're pushing ourselves forward, and you see that in these kids. That's why the school is absolutely amazing. So that's one. There are 36 more in that same network that are doing comparably outstanding work. And it's our pleasure this, this, this evening to have with us the head of the Crystal Ray School in New York, Dan Doherty. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Hal. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and we're grateful for our longstanding relationship with Project Redwood. And we've been connected since 2014. And it's been a really influential part of our work. Um, well, tell us a bit about uh, about Crystal Ray and about the the unique approach that you guys take to uh, 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 educating and paying for the education of these uh, low income students. The Crystal Ray schools are are founded on the premise that there is extraordinary human potential that is really marginalized in society because of the inequities that you and Alan alluded to in the first conversation, especially economic and racial inequities. And that uh, we feel like a Crystal Ray school can provide an opportunity to knock down a couple of those barriers, namely access to high quality college prep academics and exposure to the professional workplace that prepares students for a career. The combination of those two things is the the magic ingredient, I think, in unlocking the potential that students have. Um, students go to academic classes four days a week, and then they oh, work. We lost Dan. Uh, Dan is frozen on my screen. Uh, Am I here? Uh, you're back. Lost you for a sec. My apologies. Students go to class four days a week in their academic courses, and then they work one day a week at corporate partners in the New York City metropolitan area, places like Morgan Stanley. Well, you know, you can't do one of these things without having some technology challenge. So here's ours. Um, Can you hear me? Dan, I can hear you well. That's like everybody's yeah, I, I see and hear you fine. Yeah, how well, I'm hearing him fine. All right. Uh, we might have lost Hal, though. It might be Hal who's freezing at his end. The good news is, is I have Hal's questions in front of me. <laughs> so, oh, did we lose Hal? No, I'm back. He's back. All right. Well, I can always be a backup because I, I have Hal's questions. But Hal, I'll let you keep going. Um, well, uh, uh, so, Dan, did you, uh, so I, did I miss you were talking about the, uh, the, the work study part of your program? I was I was just starting to get into that in some detail. Great. So you didn't you didn't miss a thing. Okay. So so students spend one day a week working at one of our corporate partners, places like Morgan Stanley and Goya and Phillips Van Heusen or J.P. Morgan, and in those jobs, the students recognize that they're just as smart as the adults sitting next to them. They just haven't got the college degree and the opportunity to work yet, and having that experience of perhaps being uh, 
introduced to a field they never would have considered before and to interact with adults in a very professional setting gives students the added motivation to see purpose behind their ed academic education and it sets them up for great college success. The way that we track our, our progress really is through the students' preparedness for college and their success through college. Uh, I think initially the thought was, you know, getting into college was, was great, but it's very clear that the difference in attaining a college degree and not is marked you know, as much as a million dollars in lifetime earnings, for example. And so we've invested in graduate support so that our students virtually all gain admission to four-year schools and are graduating or are on track to graduate from college at a 77% rate, which is about five times the national average for students like ours. And a lot of it is based on that uh, experience in a corporate work setting paired with the academics. So I, I asked Alan about scalability, and I want to ask you the same question. I, I, again, I, you know, what you are doing is phenomenal, and it's a, uh, you know, it, it's a it's a bright shining exception to what we see, um, you know, mostly in in urban education. I mean, you're sitting in New York City, the largest and most segregated uh, public school system in the United States, and one that certainly does not do a great job with low income students of color. What makes well, two questions, really. What is it that enables you guys to be as successful as you are? And how, how scalable are you? What, what, how big could Crystal Ray become? What are the major constraints to your ability to grow? I think it's helpful to understand the context. The first Crystal Ray school started in Chicago in 1996. So in that 25 year period, we've grown from one school in the Pilsen neighborhood to 37 schools around the country now 12,000 students and about 20,000 alums. And we're on track to grow to 50 schools and 20,000 students in the years ahead. There are schools planned now in places like the Research Triangle and Charleston and Miami and Orange County. And I think that, you know, to answer sort of both parts of the question together, what makes the schools successful is a very deliberate approach to the program, combining the academics and the work study experience in an environment like the Mojica sisters spoke about where the kids are really cared for and are challenged in a way that supports them and inspires them. I think what uh, will allow that growth to happen is the relationship with companies. You know, and so the people on the call here may have opportunities at their own firms to help us partner with new companies. It's imperative that there are enough jobs to support the program. Uh, about 40% of the revenue for a Crystal Ray school comes from the corporate work study relationship. The companies pay the students for their work and that helps pay for the education. About 50% comes from philanthropy and about, you know, less than 10 comes from the family's own contribution. Like Alan alluded to, every student has to have some skin in the game and, and their modest contribution, you know, an average family pays about 1500 bucks a year um, is a significant signal that they're invested too. Uh, it's really the corporate partnerships that drive it. And I think we have to be in cities that can sustain that. So you made, you made that pitch nice and subtly. I'm going to be just a bit more blatant about saying that if there is anyone on this call who is in a city with a Cristo Ray school and who is affiliated um, at a senior level of any kind with an organization that could use um, a, um, a full-time equivalent uh, from, a Crystal Ray, from the Cristo Ray student body, please uh, make yourself known to Cristo Ray. Again, these guys are doing really, really fabulous work. Um, so, um, there, there are, there are, there's more than one Crystal Ray school in New York city. Is there not? There is. We have a sister school in Brooklyn, which for those of you who are New Yorkers know that's like a world away in New York, but it is, uh, you know, relatively close. And it's interesting that we can serve very different geographic populations and there are plenty of students to go around and in a city as big as New York. 
plenty of jobs to be found if we can make the connections. There are two in Chicago as well, and they both are, are thriving. So um, if the chancellor of the New York City public school system were to come visit you and ask what the public schools, what, what advice you might have to offer the public schools, what would you tell him? I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah, well, they have such a nice advantage in using public money to help fund the education that <laughs> there's a certain amount of self-defeating uh, purpose in answering that question. But, uh, you know, I think the, um, the thing that, look, to be honest, public schools have a, a, a monumentally larger challenge in the breadth of people that they need to educate and the bureaucracy they need to navigate that we don't. But I think one of the things that we can share that would be extraordinary is the recognition that students from all areas have extraordinary potential and that to put them in real world settings like we do with the corporate work study program can really accelerate the growth that is possible. Um, you know, our students don't come to us with perfect grades. In fact, because they're coming from underserved neighborhoods, most come to us a grade level or two below ninth grade when they start. And it's possible to catch up, so to speak, in the right setting. Um, I think we do that in relatively smaller school sizes. You know, Crystal Ray schools range from about 350 kids to 550 kids or so. That's smaller units. And I think some of the public settings have been um, trending in that direction. Um, you know, I saw in the chat the question about how do we pick our students. You heard the Mojica sisters talk about, you know, their motivation. We, we actually look at things like attendance records and see that the kids show up at school. And being present is a primary factor in the student's likelihood to be successful with us. Um, they might have grades that are not the best, but if they're there every day and they've indicated persistence, they can do it at Crystal Ray. You guys are, you're a, you're a Catholic school, you're a Jesuit uh, organization. Um, you, you approach what you do with a very strong sense of mission. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as you look across the country at other schools, uh, either parochial charter or in some cases traditional public schools that are successful with the student population that you deal with, you often find that they all have a strong sense of mission. It may not be exactly the same as yours, um, but they, they all seem to be very, very profoundly mission driven. I, I wonder if you think that is, a, is an essential element of, uh, of your success as well. Undoubtedly. And uh, we are in fact Catholic schools. I think that drives a number of factors. One is the, the whole purpose of our being is to create a more just environment for people to live. Um, there are three congregations involved with Crystal Ray New York, the Jesuits, the Christian Brothers, and Sisters of the Holy Child. And there are a variety of religious congregations involved with the schools across the country. Um, what is shared is the sense of a service-oriented mission, a sense of commitment to one another, both on the faculty level and faculty to student level, and even from the student to support the faculty members at times. So there's this great community that is, uh, is on board with the mission. Uh, and so I think, I think that does have a central role to play in what makes it work. In many of our schools, the students themselves are not predominantly Catholic. It depends sort of on where in the country the school is located. But the sense of being of service to other people, being committed to the potential for every student to succeed in college and beyond, on the faculty level to be committed to the amount of work that goes into it and to be somewhat selfless servants to the work is, is inherent in each school. 
So um, you have been involved with uh, Project Red Redwood for several years now, if I understand correctly. Can you give us a sense of um, how the Redwood involvement works with Crystal Ray, again, both on the financial side and on the non-financial side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been with Project Redwood since about 2014, and the grants have generally been directed towards workplace training in uh, things like providing computers and licenses for online workplace training. And also, uh, Project Redwood has supported more than just New York. Is it supported the school in Brooklyn, uh, the school in San Francisco, ICA, and now also a grant with the network nationally to help provide workplace training. So the, the focus has largely been on the, the corporate work study side and making sure students are prepared to succeed in the workplace. Um, we've also had some you know, non-financial relationships in um, you know, Project Redwood supported some events at, at Crystal Ray, like an affordable housing panel and a conversation with our students, with the, the individual who's the subject of Tracy Kidder's, you know, the strength of what remains. And so there have been some other great opportunities to foster learning. Thank you so much, Dan. And, and again, um, you know, I think it is a, it's a privilege for those of us at Project Redwood to be affiliated with uh, an organization that's doing the kind of good work that you're doing as well as with, uh, with, with Mortar and Alan. So um, I have had the, uh, the pleasure of asking a whole bunch of questions. Um, I, we, we did ask that others in the audience, if you do have questions, um, you know, please um, bring them forward. And, I, I, and now I think would be, uh, if there are questions, would be a good time for uh, anybody uh, who's, who's attending to um, ask uh, Dan or Alan anything that comes to mind. Um, excuse me, Dan. Hi, I'm Carla Williams, and I've had the pleasure of doing um, some work with Chris Ray over the years with um, Rich and Rick Agresta. I have a question for you. I live in Los Angeles and the Cristo Rey school here is Verbum Day, which is all male. It's, and you're looking at Orange County, which is far from Los Angeles, it's a while down. Is there any look at opening a co-ed school here to help the young women in this city? I feel a little left out in that sense. Because <laughs> it's such a wonderful opportunity and there's so many young women in need here. It's I can just, understand why you would, you know, yeah, why you would feel that. I, I have you know, to say that's a little bit above my pay grade, okay. in that the, net, the network the folks who are in the Remo session may be in a better position to answer that okay. question than I am. Okay, um, great. But I think the, you know, the topic of uh, assuring access for the young women the young to women. the same opportunities is, is a vital question, and um, in fact, I think many of our schools actually have more women than men more women than probably men. 55 45 right mm -hmm. now and so the young ladies do a terrific job for us and and they're stars i mean you saw the mohica sisters how much better can you get than them that's right and all that's true um i i think to answer uh, julie's question i i believe in in the network folks may know better is Verbum the only all boys school and ICA the only girl, all girls school? Right. Well, Verbum That's was right. an all boys school when Crystal Ray took it over. It was an all boys school that had a legacy of Catholic schools here. So it's not like they converted mm -hmm. a co-ed school to all boys. It was an all male school. Yeah. Bo both of those both of those schools were conversion schools from prior all male and prior all girl schools. Um, and we we now start schools from the ground up. So mm -hmm. that wouldn't be something going forward. So as you cited the Orange County school, that would be co-ed and any and also, other future schools. And also Christa, uh, Project Redwood supported ICA, which is the Cristo Ray School in San Francisco. That's all girls. All girls. Bounces things out a bit. Uh, in our grants from 2014 to 2018, uh, we had about a 70% of the students in the schools were girls that we supported. I'm just, I'm just looking around at the girls here. They do a great job with both, but I have to put in a pitch for our young women in LA. Thanks, Carla. Uh, Thank any you. other questions? I, I have a question for, I guess, Mortar, when the question sustainability 
And Ellen, what I think I heard you say is almost any city in America you could scale to. But how do you pick the leaders in all your new places? I mean, you can't have everybody being you. So how do you do this? Absolutely. Uh, that is a great question. Um, so we have the unique uh, position currently where we literally have never gone out to pursue another city. Uh, they have come to us. Oh. So yeah, so it definitely makes our job a little bit easier um, because people are approaching us to do the expansion. Um, and then we do uh, kind of a readiness checklist to see if they're prepared, if they're ready for us to come. And if they're not ready now, we give them tools that they can work on to get to that place um, so that they would be. I think ultimately though, um, what one of the things that we're considering is trying to really expand to other regions that we're not currently in, which helps us with the Tulsa uh, expansion. Up until then, you know, everything had been very core Midwest. Um, and so Tulsa will be the furthest expansion for us, which is, you know, a little bit more distance and uh, it'll give us an opportunity to really start to prove the model outside of the uh, center of the, the Midwest. But I think that that's a question that um, that's really critical. Uh, you know, um, again, there are lots and lots of examples of organizations doing great work, but right. uh, their ability to scale often is tied to the talents of a particular individual. And you, you, either you can't grow beyond that individual's reach or you can't survive beyond that individual's uh, working lifetime. Um, yeah. There is another really high performing school network, a charter school network called KIPP that um, is, in, is in approximately the same number of schools that Crystal raised in they found that uh, you know, their ability to grow is constrained by their ability to have leaders, to have principals of their schools. And they've actually launched a uh, leadership uh, training academy uh, you know, inside the KIPP organization to train their own principals. I wouldn't be surprised if, if there came a day when, when Alan found himself in a comparable kind of situation, when the demand for what Mortar does simply exceeds the, the, the breadth of his and his small team, it's three founders, uh, including Alan, uh, of, of, their, of their ability to, to, to do the work. So, you know, finding the leadership and being able to sustain that leadership over time is really critical to the ongoing success of these wonderful organizations like the ones we're talking to today. How uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that I do want to highlight is that when we go to the different cities, when we're looking at expansion, we are working with other organizations that are already on the ground. So we are working, it's kind of a train the trainer model. So we are finding organizations who want to do similar work to what we're doing, who are already in the community, who are interested in building a more equitable entrepreneurial ecosystem. And we train them on how to do that. Um, and so we're looking at kind of a three year engagement to give them all of the tools that they need to get going. And then after that uh, three years, they should be ready to be self-sustaining. So uh, unlike some other entities, we don't have to be hands, you know, hands on for the entire time. We're just giving them the tools and, and training that they need so that they can carry on that mission even after we're gone and we've moved on to the next locale. So that's one of the benefits of the, the model that we have created. Outstanding. Do we have other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, there are at least three of us, if not more, who were able to visit the uh, ICA school in San Francisco, and it was an incredible experience. Uh, I know Rich has been there a couple times. Um, I'm wondering if, if I can ask the network people, if that is common to all the schools, um, to uh, have us visit, see if we can participate in, in your activities in some way. Uh, how do you encourage that? I can speak for New York. Come on by, folks. Call me and I'll <laughs> happily welcome you. And I, <clears throat> on behalf of the other 36 schools, I would say the answer remains the same. Um, you know, we, it, as educators, I think everybody on the call probably uh, thinks about what they do as uh, 
um, experimental, right? We want to we want to share what we do with everybody. We want to get feedback. We want to learn from one another. It's certainly been helpful learning from Alan and the team at Morger today. So uh, we our doors are open to all always. Um, I, have a question. I want to make I want to make a, I want to make a, another pitch here. Um, anytime Project Redwood gets involved with a grantee. We have uh, a sponsor of uh, Redwood's uh, affiliation with the grantee. That sponsorship role is really essential to uh, the success of Project Redwood and to the success of the of Redwood's relationship with its grantees. This year, we are likely to see more applications from potential grantees than Red Redwood has ever seen before. Uh, the Racial Equity Task Force that I co-chair with Mary Pruitt uh, will bring forward eight or nine potential grantees. And I think um, through the outreach efforts of um, uh, others in Project Redwood, we're, we're going to see lots and lots of, uh, of additional uh, candidates. We need sponsors for those. So for anyone on this call who is a, a graduate of any of the program, uh, I really strongly. I think Hal might have cut out, but I saw that Chad Brown had a question. Maybe we can cut to. Yeah. Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a question for uh, Alan. Uh, I was a volunteer at SCORE, uh, specifically the one in Fairfield, Connecticut, which is that and the Orange County one, and I'm in California now, are the two biggest in the country. Uh, and it's a remarkable similarity between what you're doing and what SCORE does. Uh, and one of the success factors for SCORE, which no longer calls itself the, what is it, uh, Senior Core of Retired uh, Executives, uh, they just go by score, and certainly the old acronym doesn't fit, but uh, they get a lot of benefit from uh, volunteers. I think in Fairfield County at the time I was there, it was like almost 100 executives that volunteered and, you know, met regularly and provided coaching. Um, but uh, so my question is, uh, do you or can you uh, do something similar to that with uh, mortar? Yeah, that's a great question, Chad. Uh, the partner that we've had the absolute longest is SCORE. Um, so they have been our key to making sure that all 300 of our graduates have had a mentor through the process. Uh, and that was one of the questions that I saw also come up in the chat was about the, the mentorship component. Um, SCORE has been a, an essential part of the work that we have been doing. Um, yes, I and, saw that. Yeah, and, and it's just been one of those things that there's going to be generalized things that the SCORE mentors are providing uh, as far as general business knowledge, um, but there's a lot of SCORE mentors who can't tell you the price uh, per flower in each cupcake. You know, So we yeah, are right. also recommending that they have a passion mentor um, someone who has worked directly in that same industry as well, um, so that we can make sure that they do have kind of this uh, surrounded by different tools and, and individuals who can help them through the process. So um, it definitely is giving us, you know, we're, we're here to learn. We're, we're, you know, finding mentors and guidance and uh, learning in each of the cities that we go into. Uh, and so I think that, you know, if you revisit our model in 10 years, it'll probably shift um, to accommodate for, you know, changing times and innovation. Uh, and so, you know, definitely, you know, open to different types of, you know, sure, models yeah. that are available. Yeah. The more alumni you have, the bigger the pool that you can draw from, of course. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Now you might want to continue on what you were saying before. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Where did I get cut off? I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, begging for sponsors. 
so I, I, I am I'm asking, uh, you know, any GSB affiliated person who is here this evening to consider uh, sponsoring um, potential grantees who are going through this year's uh, application process. And Hal, if we, I could just say, I'm, I'm going to be going to the Remo session. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about sponsorship. And um, Donna is actually going to be running a program that talks about, for people who don't know Project Redwood that well, what sponsorship means. Um, I don't think we've chosen a date yet, but uh, we'll be sure to let the people who attended this group know about that. Do we have a list of specific projects yet, or is it all um, speculative? Well, we don't have them yet. The, the task force is meeting weekly to go through um, candidates that we're collecting from uh, several different organizations, such as the GSB Black Alumni Organization, and we have several others. Um, we will probably know the ones that we and, and we don't want to get the sponsors involved before we have kind of culled that list a little bit. It's right. probably towards the end of this month that we will have a better idea. Okay. I have a question for Alan. Alan, when the 30th person comes to you with a cupcake business, not understanding that we could line highways with cupcakes, how do you counsel that very passionate, very driven, excellent cupcake baker into something that's likely to be more lucrative and easier to access? What do you do? do you uh, I think one of my first questions is asking them, what is their point of differentiation? Sure. Like, mm -hmm. what are you doing differently with your cupcakes? Like if they are creating something that is entirely different than everybody else is doing, then, you know, we have a conversation that we need to have. Yeah, they've got um, a keto example, cupcake. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Got, or know, or vegan right. or, Be you know, right. things Something like right. that. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had a, a lady who came through one of our recent uh, cohorts who instead of making cupcakes, she makes pound cakes, but she makes cupcake sized pound cakes. Individually. And Okay. Yeah, and it's just different. It's not something that you can just walk into your local grocery store and just pick up, you know, one small itty bitty, you know, pound cake. So um, I think that that's one of the things is that we're looking at points of differentiation. We're also asking them to ask their potential customers, you know, is where, how are you solving this problem? You know, or is there a problem? Is the problem that you need a cupcake? And if so, where are you currently solving it? And am I doing something different? that is gonna make you wanna solve the problem of I need a cupcake with me instead of all of the other 87 people that you have to walk past to get to me. And I think that that's just one of the, the really important questions that we are asking our entrepreneurs to ask themselves. So we are never trying to discourage anybody. We want them to ask their potential customers what they're looking for. And they often find through that process and, and testing their assumptions that this is not something that some people want. What and so, people yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. I think Can we might have, uh, I was gonna say we have time for about one more question, so go for it. Are you dealing a lot of times with bakers that are coming, they're home bakers, do they have the opportunity to go into a facility and see what it's like to scale? before they jump into that investment, what that really means to do that. Yes, and okay. I think that that's where a lot of people are learning that this is not what they really want to do. Not what do. they think it is. Uh, yeah, uh, because the, the cost of like the, the commercial kitchens is also, mm -hmm. it can be a barrier, um, especially if they have minimums that you have to do. And when you're thinking about an item like a cupcake or a cake, like what is the cost that I'm putting into this, then my time and billing for all of those things. But we did have somebody who went through there who came up with a really innovative way to do cookies. Um, and she has a company called Davis Cookie Collection. And then instead of just being a cookie shop, it's kind of like a Chipotle where you come in and you pick all of the different things that you want in the cookies. They bake them instantly and you walk out with custom boxes Genius. of cookies. Yeah, so it's like, how, and that's one of the things we're pushing people to become innovative and think about it differently. And if anybody wants to invest in her, let me know and I'll uh, connect you with her. <laughs> So there's definitely a franchisable opportunity here. So yeah. She can get them out of the oven. Yeah, absolutely. 
Thank you, Alan. And, and again, thank you, Dan, for, uh, for an excellent conversation. I think it's now time for us to move over to the uh, Remo platform. When is, is uh, do we have instructions on, on uh, how to do that for the folks who want to? Yes. Um, so if you are already familiar with Remo, I invite you to click the link that's in the chat and go ahead and get started over there. And if you're new to Remo, um, I can, I'm going to talk about how to get set up over here. Um, but before that, I just want to extend our thanks again to our panelists tonight. 